All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, uh, depending on where you are around the world. Uh, welcome to this uh, Particle webinar on uh, building integration, specifically with Particle and ThinkSpeak. My name is Brandon Satram, and um, I run our developer relations program at Particle. And I'm really excited to have all of you all here um, on the webinar and in the chat today. I have a couple of my colleagues here that you will uh, hear from and be available on chat over the course of the next hour. Uh, Zoe Wren, who is here and facilitating this webinar and making things happen, which we really appreciate. Um, if you have any questions around technical issues or anything like that as we're going through the webinar today, um, she can cover those. I also have a few others, uh, other of my colleagues, DJ Harrigan and Talal Gideon on the call, and uh, they are gonna be active in chat and in Q&A over the course of the next hour, especially as I'm sharing my screen and won't be able to pause and, and answer questions for the first little bit. So if you do have questions as we go through the next hour um, or a little bit less, please do post those in the Q&A. Um, the team will answer some of those as we go on, and then we'll take a little bit of time, 10 or 15 minutes at the end, and just answer uh, any notable Q&A uh, or questions that pop up that, uh, that seem kind of interesting. So let's go ahead and get started. As I mentioned today, uh, we're going to talk about integrations uh, in general and really what those look like in the particle ecosystem, uh, and then talk about integrating specifically with things speak. I'm going to start by providing a brief introduction of Particle's edge to cloud platform. Spend a few moments talking about why integrations matter. And this is general to all types of integrations, not specifically what we'll talk about today. And then I'll end the webinar today by spending a few minutes talking about building integrations with ThingSpeak and MATLAB. If you haven't looked at these tools before, it's a really easy way to explore starting to build integrations with Particle as you're interested in, as you're in looking at scaling up and scaling out your IoT solutions. Uh, and a really easy platform for connecting the two and also building advanced visualization. So we're gonna talk through that and then I'll provide some demos uh, at the end of our time here today. But first, Particle's edge to cloud platform. Now, as of 2020, Particle is serving over 200,000 customers on our complete IoT platform. We were founded just a little over eight years ago and really over the last several years have grown into being what we refer to as this edge to cloud platform and we call it edge to cloud because it spans the entire value chain of an IoT application from the physical hardware connected to sensors and actuators to connectivity for Wi-Fi and cellular, a secure device cloud for backhauling data and integrations and SDKs that help you take your IoT applications into your cloud and beyond. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about each one of those pieces so that we can uh, really drill into what sets Particle apart before we talk about integration specifically. Now for hardware and connectivity, we provide hardware that's really designed to help you prototype your ideas and easily scale to production. This has always been an important thing to us uh, from even the early days of Particle that we can create products or create devices that can be used for prototyping and then through our ecosystem very easily transition into mass production modules that can be used to scale out your solutions. In addition, we provide a number of use case specific modules that can take the guesswork out of assembling hardware to build solutions for things like asset tracking and what have you. And then finally, we provide connectivity support for cellular, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth, ensuring that you always have a way to make sure that your devices can communicate, not just with our device cloud, but with one another in some cases. Now, the Particle Device OS is the brains of every Particle device, and every device uh, that Particle provides inherits this powerful device connectivity out of the box. Now this means that you don't have to deal with certificates and servers and manual registration of devices. We also provide powerful primitives that, may, that enable you to take your connectivity to the next level to sh easily share device data and even remotely interact with your devices. And then finally, our device OS is Particle hardware agnostic, meaning that all of the key features that you're used to from one device can work on another device, be it a cellular or Wi-Fi device, a dev kit, or a mass production module. And that's another one of the ways that really makes that move from prototyping to production really easy and powerful on the Particle platform. Because when you're done prototyping, you don't have to throw out the prototype and start over. You can actually gently and easily scale that up into your mass production solution. And then finally, because we recognize that IoT applications are complex and far reaching, we provide all the tools and SDKs that a developer needs in order to be productive and to solve real problems quickly. We also provide a powerful device cloud that is secure and designed to help you transition from one to many devices. 
as well as extensive cloud integration so that you can take your solution wherever it needs to go. And that's the piece that I wanna spend really the balance of our time today talking about, this idea of why integrations matter and how they actually work in the particle ecosystem. Now, let me start by saying that we recognize at Particle that IoT solutions are rarely just about hardware and connectivity. In fact, these can often be very relatively small pieces of the overall story. When you think about an IoT solution, the hardware, the firmware piece, that's tiny compared to all of the other downstream pieces that you're thinking about when it comes to servers, backhauling cloud data, building integrations, integrating with your existing clouds, be it something like Azure, AWS, Google, or what have you, that there's really a myriad of different things that you need to think about when it comes to building IoT solutions. And part of the impetus, part of the reason why this has happened is because a lot of our IoT applications have, have, have been born out of a world where uh, embedded hardware has changed in the last 10 or 15 years, um, and really even beyond that, right? Our embedded systems have really moved from closed to open over the course of the last decade or more, right? Because the kinds of embedded systems that we used to build or the ones that we built previously were closed, self-contained systems. For instance, the machine on a shop floor may have been a very sophisticated system with complex embedded software, um, but it was localized, right? And if there was a monitoring system in place, it was localized. And if the machine broke, you replaced it. All of your intelligence about this machine and about the system was localized to the facility, the building that that machine was placed in. And this worked really well in a world of localized on-premise computing. Put it another way, it worked in a non-mobile world, in a non-connected world. And while these systems were the norm previously, with the power of connectivity, they're becoming rare. And it's not just connectivity for connectivity's sake. I know that in the early days of the IoT, we went through this period where we put a Wi-Fi or a cellular chip in everything just because we could, whether or not it actually made sense. But connectivity is really about more than that. In a modern system, connectivity is about enabling insight and control really across the world. It's about moving our ability to visualize and monitor anywhere, not just the shop floor, but a hundred yards or a few thousand miles away to enable global organizations to do business. And it's about enabling mobile control so that we can take actions on our systems from anywhere and at any time when we most need to. And finally, it's about leveraging the power of the cloud and the infinite computing it provides for the kinds of insights that we could never actually replicate on a factory floor. The kind of insight that helps us spot problems before they happen so that we can fix machines before they break before replacing them uh, and replace them before it's actually too late. So this is all hypothetical. I'm speaking in relatively theoretical terms about the power of the cloud and connectivity and integrations. Let me give you a practical example from one of Particle's customers. This is Jacuzzi. Now Jacuzzi is a name brand that all of you probably recognize. They're a well-known hot tub manufacturer and they sell spas to thousands of consumers in hotels every year. But the reason that Jacuzzi chooses connectivity and enabling Wi-Fi and even uh, you know, other types of connectivity for their tubs is not because they want to enable consumers to turn the hot tubs on from inside their house without going outside. That is a capability that connectivity provides, but that's not really the value to a company like Jacuzzi. The real point of connectivity in Jacuzzi's case is enabling monitoring, enabling service and control. And so in this instance, one of the ways that Jacuzzi could theoretically use integrations is by doing something with the particle with particle in the Salesforce service cloud, right? To monitor the, the state of the pumps, to, to monitor water quality data and things like that, and then actually publish alerts into the Salesforce service cloud, which then can allow service people to turn around and service those top tubs. The point here is not enabling connectivity for its own sake, but enabling something to actually happen that extends the life of an asset, that allows that asset to be properly managed and monitored over time. Um, but the key piece here is that you're using your particle solution and the integrations that we provide to reach into another system, to actually play with another part of your entire end-to-end -end infrastructure. And when you're looking at integrating with particle, there's really three types of integrations that are typically at play. Built-in cloud integrations. You can use a service like If This Then That, which is a relatively simple way to get started with integrations. And then really for anything else, we have extensible support via webhooks, right? Anything, any system that can catch a webhook can be integrated with the particle ecosystem. But as I mentioned, probably the simplest way to get started using integrations with particle and other services is using if this, then that. And there are a ton of predefined app lists that you can use and interesting things from publishing notifications into other systems like Google Sheets, 
uh, to checking weather with your device, to opening your garage door, et cetera. Um, if you've ever done anything in the home automation space or just sort of tinkering and messing around, if this and that is a great way to sort of start to explore the power of integrations on the particle platform. And once you're ready to go beyond that, we do have a couple of different flavors of integrations beyond that. One is our sort of first class integrations. If you're using Google Maps or Azure IoT or Google Cloud Platform, we have sort of, we have first class integrations for these that are really designed to wrap some of the complexity of integrating and bringing these two systems together in a way that you can start to quickly and easily stream sensor data uh, into, into backhauling, backhauling that data into your own cloud. And once you're in a system like Azure, you can actually easily use a tool like Azure IoT Central to create device dashboards and to tie device telemetry into visualizations and then ultimately control and monitor your devices from that, from that application. And then as I mentioned before, for anything else, for anything else that you, uh, where you would look to, to bring to particle or bring your particles application into another system, we have support for webhooks. So anything that can catch a webhook can be integrated with your particle devices. And the, the uh, setup process is pretty easy. I'm gonna show that off here in a few minutes. But the way that this ultimately looks is you're specifying a URL. So the system uh, of record where you actually want to push your sensor data becomes the place where you get that webhook URL. You specify, set it up on the particle end, and then we do the work of responding to publishing events and putting those into the right place. But let's get practical here and let's actually talk about integrations specifically with a product uh, like ThingSpeak and to use MATLAB for visualizations. Now, this is just an example that I'm showing off in the context of this webinar today. Everything else that I've talked about to this point is generic and is applicable to any system that you might be integrating with, whether it's Azure, whether it's AWS, whether it's Google Cloud, or even other tools and services like Zapier, if this and that. Salesforce, Zoho, you name it, right? There are lots of different ways that you can actually integrate your IoT solutions into your systems of record, into the systems that you need to work with for your applications. But I do wanna spend some time talking about ThingSpeak because I think that ThingSpeak is actually a very powerful platform that's easy to connect to and can give you a taste for the kinds of things that you can start to do with data processing, data visualization, once you set up your IoT applications. So what I'm gonna do here in the demo in a little bit is actually show you the way that this works. But one of the beauties of using a tool like ThingSpeak is that once you've actually made the connection between the two systems, between Particle and ThingSpeak, you get some charts and graphs out of the box for free. That's just sort of part of the entry experience. You set up a channel, you start streaming data into that channel, and voila, you've got visualizations that you can very easily edit. Um, but because ThingSpeak is part of the MathWorks, you also have the ability to create MATLAB analysis and visualization. So you can actually process your data and do something with it. And you can add additional visualizations, gauges and things like that as well. We'll go through all of that in, uh, in, the, little, in the demo piece here in the next couple of minutes. But with any integration, this is specific for things uh, for things speak, but step one here and step one and two is really the way that this works for anything where you're setting, setting up a webhook. You start by publishing data to the particle cloud. This is really, to be frank, the easiest part of this entire process because it's just a simple matter of capturing the sensor data that you actually need from your IoT applications, from your devices in firmware, and then calling Particle Publish. Um, one of the beauties of this API, and I love talking about it because it's, it is, I've gone through the heavy lifting of setting up, my own, setting up my own MQTT servers on the back end, dealing with all of the process, making sure that certificates are properly managed and on the right devices and all of those things are, are, are in place. The Particle Publish handles everything transparently for me. So it's simply a matter of gathering my data, calling Particle Publish, and then I'm off to the races from there. Now then the second piece of that process is setting up a webhook. And webhook is, a webhook is basically on the Particle end, a subscriber to any events, any events that you publish. And so um, what, I, what you can do when you set that up is specify an event name that you're listening for and then an ultimate hook URL on the other end to publish that to. In the case of ThingSpeak, there's a specific URL uh, and every system would have that, well, would have that a little bit different, but when, in setting up the webhook, you can specify the type, the format, the, to listen to an individual device or a fleet of devices or all of your devices, et cetera. And then you put that into your system, your ultimate system of choice. 
From there, step three, create visualizations, process data. Uh, and that is something that we're going to look at today. Outside of the out-of-the-box visualizations that you get with ThinkSpeak, there's a couple of other uh, interesting things that you can do, one of which I'll show off today. You can create gauges, numeric displays to show current values, and also lamp indicators, um, which are, are kind of cool thing to mess with as well. But when you specify widgets, the ThinkSpeak, the, the, web UR, the web UI gives you a lot of capability to, uh, to mess with values to specify ranges, intervals, fields to map to, all that kind of stuff, and you get a nice gauge out of the other end, which we will spend some time talking about. But really, ThinkSpeak is more than just a data visualization platform, and I hinted at this already when I mentioned this, but because ThinkSpeak is part of MathWorks, you have the ability to use MATLAB either in the browser or on the desktop to actually process the data as it comes in. So it's not just about in this case, and this is something that we see from a lot of our customers, that a IoT solution, you are dealing with sensor data, but when you get your sensor data into your system of record, into your cloud, you need to do something with it, right? Uh, you need to actually process the data to, to scrub it, to refine it, to make decisions based on the data that comes in. And so ThingSpeak with MATLAB actually provides a really easy way for you to do that, to create different or derived uh, data, to create derived visualizations, and even to provide um, additional charts and graphs and things like that as well. So that's enough of all of the uh, specifics of just sort of talking about uh, talking about these things at a high level generally. I actually want to show you uh, what this looks like now. So I'm going to get out of my slides here and then go directly into code. So a couple of things I want to show here. I'll pull up my window here. Um, so I have a Part, a couple of part of a particle device and some sensors actually on my desk here, and this camera will focus. I have a particle argon, and of note for the case of the demo today, a very simple DHT11 temperature and humidity sensor, and that's just capturing the temperature and humidity in my office. Um, now, the way that this looks, um, the way that this looks in code is I am. And there's a lot that's actually going on in here, but the important piece is that I have a couple of particle variables that are set up to capture my temperature and humidity. But what I'm doing is every couple of seconds, I'm just getting the current temperature and humidity. I'm writing those out to the console. And then what I'm going to do eventually is actually publish those. I'm gonna actually put those into the particle device cloud. If I look at my browser window here, you can see uh, I am getting some data in, but that's just my light meter. That's a separate device that's on here that's publishing. I want to actually now add some additional functionality here that will uh, publish the temperature and humidity and light values in a payload so that I can then integrate that with ThingSpeak. So the first thing that I want to do here is I'm going to actually install a library. I want to send, and ThingSpeak prefers this anyway, but I want to actually send my publish message as a JSON payload, as a JSON object. Um, I can do that by hand. If you've ever created JSON objects in C, C++, it's not impossible, but it's also not super fun and not very clean. So I'm going to install a great library that I highly recommend everyone look at if you're doing this. It's called a J it's called the JSON parser generator. And um, I just need to spell it correctly. JSON parser generator uh, from one of the uh, fantastic developers on our team from Rick Casagumba. Um, I highly recommend checking that library out. Once I have that installed, I can include it here. And you'll see the power of this library here in just a moment. Once I've installed that, I am actually going to now put it to work. I'm going to create a new function at the bottom of my firmware here that just creates that event payload. And here's where the library actually does its, uh, its wonderful magic. I'm creating a new object. And then basically within that object, creating a JSON payload to pass along my temp humidity and light values. I don't have to do any string escaping, any of that kind of stuff here. The JSON parser generator allows me to very cleanly do this. So now I have that object. It's really just a simple, a simple matter of calling my particle publish. I'm going to pass in, I'm going to call particle publish. I'm going to pass in n vowels. And then get buffer basically just gives me that C string of the JSON object that I then pass in uh, into the particle device cloud. And that's really it. From there, I need to actually call this function that I've created. So I'm going to go back up into my loop. And in my loop, after I have read those values up here, I'm going to just create, an, um, create that event payload, publish the event, and that's that. So I'm going to flash this firmware to my device. 
and it is connected. It's going to go into DFU mode as I'm doing a local flash here right now. It's building it and sending it over. So let me actually go over to the particle console. We can watch events stream across and I'm going to take a drink of water while I wait for that flash to finish. All right, I am getting an indication that the device is going offline and coming back online. I see breathing cyan happening. All right, so I now have a payload. So you'll see, without having to do any string escaping, this was actually pretty nice. I got temp humidity and light level in here pretty cleanly, easily. That's it, I'm done on the firmware side. That is all I had to do uh, with my firmware in order to get this ready to integrate into a third-party system. So my next step is actually going to be to it's going to be on the ThingSpeak side. So it's thingspeak.com. If you haven't created an account there and you want to go uh, do this as well, the, creating a ThingSpeak account is free. Uh, it's easy to use and the developer um, permissions here are pretty, uh, the, the, the developer loads seem to be pretty generous. I've been testing this a lot and haven't really run into, run into any issues. So create a new account um, on ThingSpeak and then you want to create a new channel. And that channel is going to represent basically a repository for, uh, for your data, where you're actually pushing everything that you're sending along. So I'm gonna create a new channel and I'm gonna call that sensor values webinar. And then you'll notice you can specify up to eight fields that the channel can receive. They don't all have to be, you can set up fields that represent derivative data, things like that. But in our case, we have three fields that represent the temperature, that represent the humidity, and that represent the light level. So we'll set each of those. Um, this is not required, but I'll just set and specify in the metadata that this is gonna come in as JSON, and then I will save that channel. Now, once I've done that, you'll notice I mentioned earlier, I have some charts that are here. I don't have any data in this channel yet, but I do, uh, I do have some chart values or, or charts that are ready to receive data. Um, and then the next thing that I'm going to need is actually my API keys. Now, I'm gonna show you my API keys window. Don't worry, as soon as this webinar is over, I'm deleting these channels, so these will not be available for you or anyone else to use at any point, especially if you're watching this later. But the API keys window shows you your write and read API keys for your individual channel, and you're going to <clears throat> need that here for the next step, excuse me. The next step is actually to create an integration. Um, inside of the particle console, console.particle.io, you will open integrations here on this little um, hub and spoke icon right here. Once you open up your integrations, you can click on the new integration card at the bottom of the screen, pick webhook as your integration of choice, and you're going to now build the webhook using this interactive UI. If you're a command line junkie, we do have the ability to create webhooks in the CLI as well. You can check out more info about that at docs.particle.io, but for now, I'm actually going to use the the browser, so the web UI in order to do that. My event name is nvals, and then the URL that I need is actually gonna be the same. Uh, some services will give you a specific webhook that might, be, that might be specific to their, to your app, to the thing that you've set up. In the case of ThingSpeak, it's just api.thingspeak.com slash update, and the API key is what's used to differentiate. I'm gonna set this, the verb is post, and this is gonna be a web form, and I'm going to, specify my device as just the device that I've used here. I could catch from all my devices if I wanted to, uh, but I just wanna receive messages from that one device. The next thing that I'm gonna do is go into advanced settings because there's more than I need to do. I need to change the default, of the default values that are sent by particle to customize these form fields based on what ThingSpeak actually needs to receive uh, in order to work properly. So the first thing that I need to send is my API key. And that's where I'm gonna go back here and get my right API key from my ThingSpeak channel. And I'm gonna add three more rows. And those three rows are gonna to correspond to the three fields that I set in the channel. Um, now, even though on my channel, I actually specified those keys as, if you'll remember, specify the channels as temp, humidity, and light, the actual keys that I need to use are specific. ThingSpeak is looking for field one, field two, field three, et cetera. 
So that's the next piece that I need to specify here. I need to actually map field one to a value, field two to a value, and et cetera. So I'll specify these two, these three here real quick. And now I need to extract something from that JSON object. If you remember what I'm sending along in the particle console is temperature, humidity, and light, right? Um, what's happening in the event that comes along in terms of the actual raw event payload, that is in an object called particle event data, but I can actually use some um, handlebar syntax to actually take that out. If you've done uh, web hooks and custom payloads before, you may be familiar with the handlebar syntax here. Um, if you go and I'm going to mess this up if I go back into default, but if you look at the default settings, it actually shows you what some of those look like. But I can actually use the triple handlebar syntax to actually get values out of this payload based on how I specified them. So this is just a replacement value that looks in that data payload and then treats it as a JSON object and extracts out the temperature value. And I get the same thing here for humidity. And finally, for light. Specify all of that. I don't need to change anything else. I'll create my webhook. And then because I'm publishing pretty regularly, every three seconds or so, or two or three seconds, I can actually refresh my screen here, scroll to the bottom, and I should actually see uh, some success messages already. So you'll see what this looks like. I, was, I specified data, humidity, light. I got a 200 OK back from ThingSpeak. So now I can actually go back over to my channel, and if all worked well, I've got data coming in. So I've set up, that was actually pretty simple. That was five, 10 minutes worth of work to actually get these two talking together. So now every time a new value is being read from my particle device, it's being set into thing, sent into ThingSpeak, the connection is made, and now I can actually get to do the fun part, which is playing with the charts and graphs and things like that. So that's actually what I'm gonna do. I spend a couple of minutes doing now to show you sort of what the editing experience looks like inside of this. And every tool is gonna to be different. If you're using, I've, I've done a lot of these things before, where I'll point people into using Google Sheets and you can create uh, you know, visualizations in Google Sheets and things like that. I've done um, Azure IoT Central and Google Cloud and for every one of these, it'll be different in terms of how you do visualizations. And so this is really just sort of representative, but the, the, the hard work was just getting these systems tied together and now that they're together, you are, uh, you, can, you can go nuts with it. So I am actually going to change each of these charts here to customize them a little bit. I'm gonna set my title here to temperature. I'm gonna set the color to a different color that maybe you'll recognize when I save it and then change this to a spline type. And so I've got a nice little particle cyan blue there now. I'm much happier with that than the red. I'm going to change my humid, change this title to humidity, also to a type of spline. Um, and then for my light level, change that to light. And I'm going to change this to a step, a nice little staggered step chart, just to give it a little bit of a difference, difference there. So that's it. I was able to customize these charts. So as the values change, you'll notice that these are all these are updating every 15 or 20 seconds, I think, is default uh, in ThingSpeak. So they're actually updating pretty regularly as new data is coming, is streaming in. So now I'm actually going to add a widget here. I'm going to add a gauge because I'm capturing temperature. So I want to show temperature over time, but it makes sense that I would actually also want to show the current temperature, right? So I'm going to do current temp. It's going to be field one. You'll notice here that's the representation, not the actual name that I've given it. And then I live in Texas, so my max temperature is over 100 around here. I'm going to set it to 110. Man, it'll probably never get it to zero here, but I'm going to leave it at zero. It's fine. And then I am going to add some ranges here for each three. So from 90 to 110, I'll be red. That makes sense. That's the, the hottest value. Um, for here, for my second, I'm going to set this one to blue. And I'm going to have it from 0 to 40 will be blue. And then green is 41 to 89. And that's it. I'll create that. And now I have 80. Here we go. It's 80 in my office. I get cold easily. Um, so there, now I have a gauge that actually shows me that current value. Um, you can do a couple of other widgets if you just wanted to show a numeric value like humidity. 
You can do a lamp indicator. If you're actually actuating something like an LED or what have you, you can actually have this indicate whether or not something is on or off. Uh, it's pretty easy to do in ThingSpeak as well. That's sort of the basic piece. But as I mentioned before, because ThingSpeak is a part of MathWorks, there is MATLAB support. And MATLAB, um, MATLAB gives you the ability to do a lot more than just what you see here in terms of tying um, these two systems together. So what I wanna do next is actually create something that derives data based on the data that I have that, that comes in. And so I'm getting temperature and humidity and light, but I wanna calculate the dew point. So the dew point in Fahrenheit, which is basically just given the current temperature and a couple of constants, what is the temperature at which dew will form on the grass? That's my, that's my, my dew point. So I'm gonna go and actually create another channel. So I'm gonna open this up in a new tab. I'm gonna create a channel and we're gonna call it dew point. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna get three values here, temperature. I will also capture humidity in here. So just pull it over. And then my last one is gonna be dew point. And I'm going to save that. So now I'm gonna go into MATLAB analysis. And I'm going to just create, and you'll notice when you do MATLAB analysis or visualization that they actually provide a lot of examples of how you can actually get data out of one channel to do things like calculating temperatures, reading the channel, replacing missing values. Um, MATLAB can be a little intimidating because it is a, pro, I mean, there's a programming language and syntax to it. Um, so it's nice to actually see some examples of sort of the way that, uh, the way that MATLAB works. Um, so I'm just going to go with no template. Show you custom. And I'm going to do dew point calculation. And what I am going to do here, I'm referencing, is I need to actually, since I have two channels here, what I'm basically doing is I'm reading from one channel and I'm writing to another channel. So I need to actually get both of those channel IDs, which is the way that which is the way that MathWorks works, um, is identifying the channels that you've created by um, by these numeric values. So I'm getting my this out of, I'm getting values out of my sensor values channel and then I'm writing them into my dew point measurement channel. And then the next thing that I need to do is actually get my read and write keys. So right, I'm going to get the read key from my sensor values channel. And you'll notice here that MathWorks actually does provide some great um, our ThingSpeak actually does provide channel info here on the side, so you're not toggling between different tabs to figure out, oh, what are the keys and IDs and things like that. So it's really easy for you to jump back and forth between them. So once I have those, I actually want to get my temperature and humidity out of my sensor values channel. So I just use a ThingSpeak read method, get those values out. I get the last 20 values from uh, of temperature and humidity. And now that I've got those, I can actually do some processing. So because I am capturing this, I'm capturing this data in Fahrenheit, first thing I'm gonna to need to do to calculate the dew point is actually to convert it to Celsius um, because I'm using a couple of constants for this calculation. So I convert it to Celsius and then I set some vapor and pressure constants, which allows me to then get the gamma and the dew point, most importantly, the dew point. Now this dew point value, again, the temperature at which dew would form uh, on the ground is in Celsius. So I can just do a reverse to get it back into Fahrenheit. And then the fun part is I process that data. I can actually save it back into a new channel. So I'm writing now into my dew point measurement channel, temperature, humidity, and dew point, our dew point, excuse me, using that right key. And that's really as simple as it is. I've actually done now post-processing on sensor data from my IoT system, created a new valuable piece of data, and then I'm saving it back. Now I could save it back in my existing channel. In this case, I'm saving it into, uh, into a separate channel. So I have run that code. So now what I should be able to do is actually to go back to my channel. And you'll see in my dew point channel that these values have now been streamed into this new channel as well, as well as my brand new dew point value uh, as that comes in here. So when my temperature is 80, the dew point is around 62.8, 62.9 degrees, right? So 
compound data. And then now this is now the interesting thing here is this is only run once, right? I ran this analysis, I got those values in, but I ultimately want to be able to run it repeatedly. I want to actually set this to run um, on an interval of some kind. So I can actually in that analysis, click on this time control menu. I got to it a little fast. So let me go back. On the bottom of my analysis, click on time control here under scheduling actions and give this a name and I will call it time control for the dew point. I'm going to have it recur basically every 10 minutes or so. And I'm going to choose a map of analysis, the thing to run, and then run that dew point calculation. So once I have saved that, it takes me back to the analysis and it shows me that I'm getting that value saved. And so you'll see now every five, every 10 minutes or so, I'm running that, getting new values set in there, and I've created a, a calculation as those come through. So these charts will then update less frequently, right? Because they're not streaming real data like my sensor values are. They're streaming data that has actually been post-processed and brought in uh, a little bit later. So that is interesting. I was able to actually take IoT data, take data from my sensors to create derived data. Um, but a lot of times once we do that, we also want to create more complex visualizations. And one of the things that I really like about ThingSpeak is you do get some out of the box visualiz out of the box visualizations, but again, because of MATLAB support, you can actually do complex visualizations. You can do your own charts and graphs based on really whatever that you want to do, as long as you're comfortable in doing a little bit of MATLAB in order to make that work. And so, what I'm going to do now is actually again for my channel, click on the MATLAB visualization piece here. I'm going to click custom, again create. I don't need to use a template here. And here what I want to do is create a dew point visualization that brings my temperature, humidity, and dew point all together in one place. Now, again, um, I need to get a read channel ID, just like I did before, um, as well as a read key. And in this case, I'm reading from this channel, the channel that I just that I am writing to. And my read key is here below. And there'll be less code here, but first thing that I want to do is actually get, I'm going to get say that I want to get the last 100 data points. I just created this. I won't have the last 100 data points in, but this gives you an idea. I'm basically creating a couple of arrays that represent all of my, my, current, my temp, humidity, and dew point. The last 100 readings of those time stamped as well so that I can create a visualization around that. Now I'm gonna create a plot with those timestamps and my dew point data, All right? That's my X and Y values. And then create a couple of labels, title, legend. I'm just gonna copy and paste this code in here so you don't have to watch me slowly typing it for the next couple of minutes. And add a legend and I've created a plot. So. Um, again, if you've used C, C++, JavaScript, what have you, I mean, the syntax is going to seem pretty similar. The real piece where you'll need to use docs and things like that is just looking up how to create plots and reading and writing from channels and things like that. But really, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to actually construct something that creates a custom visualization. So I can save and run this. And now I have a custom chart. Now, obviously I can, there's a whole lot more I can do to customize labels, legends, uh, how, how the grid is shown, points, uh, curves, things like that as well. But now I've actually created a complex visualiz visualization that doesn't just have these values separately, uh, doesn't just have my temperature and humidity and dew point on separate graphs, but actually brings them together so I can get sort of a different perspective on them. And once you've created this visualization, it's actually uh, available right there by default in the dashboard for your channel. So I had, these, I had these values already, but now that I've created this visualization, this more complex view, that's showing up here as well. So I can get a closer view on what my dew point looks like when the temperature and humidity are, certain, are, are at a certain point. So um, that just gives you, again, the general idea. The reason why I wanted to show off ThingSpeak was A, just to show off the power and simplicity of creating an integration on the particle side and then backhauling that data into a system like ThingSpeak and then building some broader, uh, more interesting visualizations based on that. Because again, we recognize that when you're integrating with another system, you have a cloud you're already working with, right? You have 
data in another system, you need to have the ability to create derived data so that you can build reports and make decisions and have some intelligence about the way that your systems are behaving. And then also have the ability to actually create complex visualizations to allow you to make decisions uh, and things like that. So um, hopefully this was a uh, sort of an interesting quick overview of everything that is available here. Um, I will actually share some of the resources for this um, on our community, um, community.particle.io. And I think now would probably be a good time to actually take a look at some Q&A. So I'm gonna do that here in a little bit. Let me see, how do I get that? Ah, uh, Q&A window. Um, all right, let me see how I can get the Q&A window to not do that. There it goes, okay. Jamie, hey, how's it going? Uh, all right, so I see a question here from Jamie Powell. Um, so that is a cool particle mounting board. Um, so this, I'll, I'll actually, now I have, to, I have to show it again. I gotta go back into my QuickTime player so that y'all can see it. So this is one of my favorite things um, for when I am traveling with particle devices and also just working with them at home. But the, the name of the company that creates these is PhaseDoc. So if you go to phasedoc.com, a uh, big shout out to them. They're based in, they're a startup based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, but they create these devices and really they, anything. They have um, these little clicks here that work with Raspberry Pi, Arduino, things like that as well. Um, but I have one of these PhaseDoc workbenches from them and it's a pretty, uh, pretty fantastic, uh, fantastic little device. So thanks for the question, Jamie. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so Marilio, um, Marilio Fabiano, webhooks are great when you have 10 or 15, it gets very difficult to manage more. Does Particle have thoughts on tools to organize them, categorize them on a browser view? Marilio, that's a fantastic question and I love that. Um, we do have thoughts, obviously a lot of different opportunities for the way to really provide um, more of a webhook central command, um, the ability to actually manage your integrations more cleanly. Um, not anything that I can share publicly right now, but I do know that the team is very interested in making webhook support, not only expanding webhook support, but also making webhooks feel um, like a, you know, more control center, give you more of a control center dashboard type of view uh, for, those, for those kinds of things. So um, next one, let's see here. Um, Edgar, Edgar Panky, hey Edgar, thank you so much for the question. Um, why use a webhook instead of connecting directly to ThingSpeak from the particle device? Edgar, that's a great question. Um, you absolutely can do that. So um, if you want to publish directly, publish data directly into ThingSpeak into Azure, into AWS, um, that is absolutely something that is possible. Um, we are not going to stop you from doing that. The, the disadvantage of that approach is that you don't go through the particle device cloud. So we can't guarantee connectivity. You're doing work to set up your own TLS certificates to actually create a secure connection. You're having to deal with MQTT um, communication directly. It will bloat the size of your firmware. Um, you actually can do it. And there are some cases where it may actually make sense for you to do so. And if you use particle libraries, there are libraries out there that allow you to make those direct connections into AWS or into Azure or what have you. Um, but you are creating a much larger firmware size. It's a little bit more complexity for you on the setup side. And then it's not as simple as using particle publish. In that case, you're actually posting those payloads and you're not getting the benefit of the publish APIs functions and variables, things like that, using those particle primitives through the, the particle device cloud directly. Um, all right. Um, Tomoyuki, uh, you wanna ask three questions? Oh, I see them down there further below. So I will go and get to those. This is great. I love that y'all have, have some good questions here. Um, Edgar, another question. Is the most economic standard license purchasable, purchasable from ThingSpeak $650 a year? Um, I don't know. I actually cannot speak to their pricing. I do think that they have um, some other developer pricing options, but I can tell you that the free tier that I have used at least has been really powerful and hasn't really barred me from doing anything that, that I've needed to do. So, um, Edgar, if you want to shoot me an email at brandon at particle.io, and really anybody can if you have any follow-up questions after this, brandon at particle.io. Um, I am happy to 
uh, check with my contacts at, uh, at MathWorks and find out uh, what the other options there might potentially be. All right, Grilio, again, is there an easy way to monitor the charts on smartphones without opening a browser? Um, Marilio, there is. So, I, it, as far as I'm aware, um, are you asking? Well, without opening a browser, here's what I can tell you: there actually is a way to create public URLs for each of these things. So, you can actually create a public URL here. So, I could save this and run this visualization, and then I could actually send this URL to any of you all. You could open it on a phone or what have you. But it is a it is a browser based UI. I think if you're using the MathLab or the MATLAB uh, desktop app, you may have the ability to to do have the visualizations open there. But in terms of a ThingSpeak app or something along those lines, I'm I'm not not entirely certain. If you want to shoot me an email, um, also I'm happy to follow up and see uh, check with the team on that. I would like to do FFT. Do you have an FFT library? Boy, that is a great question. Um, we the last time I checked, we do not have an F, an FFT library, but I can tell you, um, Tomoyuki, if you go to build.particle.io, the best place to look is to open up. You can open up an app if you want, but actually click on the little libraries tab right here. If you're interested in looking for a library or sort of seeing what's available out there, um, you can actually do a search. So let's do it live right here. There is. There's a couple of different FFT libraries that are available. Um, I've not used either of these. I cannot speak for them, um, but they're definitely there. And uh, yeah, definitely check them out. So that would be the best place to go. I would like to send data. So you take, capture vibration data using webhooks. The data is a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would not try to send a, a ton of data via you absolutely can. I mean, you, the, the issue here is not so much what webhooks can support or the size of the payloads, but just the size of your pipe, right? Um, and Tomoyuki, this is actually, maybe we should do another webinar on this because this is a topic that I could spend hours and hours on. Um, I've done a lot of ML work over the last couple of years and even machine learning on devices. I would actually recommend taking a look at, um, we actually do have a TensorFlow Lite library um, or maybe it's just TF light. Is it TF light? Where did it go? Mm, okay. And it's not showing up for me right now, and I don't know why. But we do have a TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow Light Micro Library for actually doing some of this work. And I would recommend, if if it's possible for your use case, it may be interesting to take a look at. Could you actually do some of the machine learning? work on device or at least within on another device that's available on Bluetooth and network or something along those lines and then publishing the data to the cloud because I, I would say that with the hardware and the way that our, our uh, machine learning libraries have gotten that it's actually increasingly possible to do more and more of the actual early processing and early running of machine learning models to get predictions without having a stream and pipe all that data into the cloud. Um, your second question, how do you think about Maintenance. I would like to use particle for predictive maintenance, remote monitoring, remote controlling, but we're concerned about maintenance. Because you do have maintenance, not only some equipment, but also, let's see. Um, system and also because you can't know the equipment condition. Yeah. So, um, Tomo, you, I, I think your question definitely gets, gets very much into the machine learning part of this conversation. So, please. Again, shoot me an email, brandon at particle.io. I would love to hear a little bit more about what it is you're looking to do and just talk about sort of how we think about predictive maintenance, how even machine learning on device machine learning could possibly be a solution for you all uh, and what integrations could possibly, uh, could possibly work right there. So please do, please do shoot me a note on that. Um, oh, um, Magdi, yes, I missed the question on how to connect particle to Azure. So, um, Maggie, the answer to your question is to actually head over to docs.particle.io. And if you go into the tutorial section, you, you can check out an integration with Azure IoT. So, this is your place to go, docs.particle.io, tutorials, integrations, Azure IoT Hub. Um, I will go ahead and type that answer here so that you can see it. Uh, but, yeah, I appreciate the question. 
Next question. When publishing to a custom webhook, what are some recommended methods for ensuring that messages reach and are successfully really received by the destination site? Uh, E.g. site returns a 400 error. How do we make sure the device knows exactly what went wrong? Um, that is a good question. So it is actually possible. Um, I would actually take a look at our docs on integrations a little bit more. Let's see, where did I do? Ba, 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 ba. Um, if you check out our docs on webhooks, there's actually more reference and more information in there about how you can actually deal with responding to webhooks, whether or not they were successful. Um, now, I can't recall off the top of my head if you can actually get the specific error code, um, but there is enough info in there where I think you could at least build some retry capability uh, into your firmware that way. Uh, next question, Magdi, is there a way to customize the ThinkSpeak website uh, to white label it, private label or domain? Um, I believe that there is, but that would be a conversation with the, uh, with the ThingSpeak team and definitely not on the free tier. But if you want to, again, shoot me an email, uh, I'm happy to put you in touch with the team to, uh, to ask that of them. Aaron's Walter, is it possible to process data on Particles Cloud instead of, instead of ThingSpeak? It is not possible today to do that level of data processing in our device cloud. That definitely is something that we've had customers ask and we're interested uh, in providing that level of capability. Um, so stay tuned for more information around that, but it is actually not possible today. Jamie, bit of a weird question. Any plans to officially add supported LoRa library? Um, no official plans at this point, but we do have a lot of customers that are starting to experiment with LoRa. I'm particularly very interested in LoRa, and because our libraries are uh, community supported, there's definitely room to contribute a library. And if we get a lot of customer interest, I think we could see a an official library actually taking uh, taking shape at some point pretty soon. But yeah, it's a good question. And Marilio, um, when you created the custom charts, where did the code you pasted come from? Where is it documented? Ah, yes, good question. So the code that I pasted came from because I always have to have backup plans. I don't I don't like doing live live coding because so many things can go wrong. I um, I copied that from other channels where I had sort of already gone through this. But there's a couple of different places where you can do this. I will actually take from the, th from the MathWorks website and their docs. I'll answer that here and you all will be able to see it in chat. But basically there's a, a number of tutorials that are available out there on how to actually create those visualizations and um, how to use some of the, um, the built-in visualizations and things like that as well. All right, so last question, Christopher Stratton, um, is there any documentation on connecting with Google Cloud as a subscriber rather than just posting data for Firebase? Um, Christopher, that's a great question. I actually have not looked at the Google Cloud Platform docs in a little while, so don't quote me on this, but I do believe that our walkthrough on GCP integration is not, does not go into Fire, Firebase. It actually uses, yeah, Google Cloud PubSub. So if you want to take a look at this doc, there actually is um, some good resources there. Hopefully that will be enough to get you started. David Graham, hey, following the Laura question, would it be possible to connect to Particle Cloud via an Iridium modem? Um, you know what, David? I don't know. And I don't want to steer you wrong, so I need to look into that. Shoot me an email, Brandon at particle.io, and I will take a look. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with the modem that you're referring to, but I need to actually dig a little bit deeper before I have an intelligent and coherent answer on that one. So I do appreciate it. Um, so I don't have any more open questions and we are actually almost right at time. So uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, DJ Talal, was there anything else that popped up that's worth covering in the last couple of minutes here? No, this was fantastic, Brandon. I, uh, I think you should do this every week. Every <laughs> hey, my yeah, thank you, DJ. You're, you're welcome. It. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, if y'all like this, we definitely do want to do more of these, um, more developer focus or to deep dive webinars. So again, those of you that are here today, thank you. If you have suggestions, if you have topics that you want us to cover, if you want me to do an integration with Azure, GCP, with something else, like let's email me, hit me up on, on Twitter at Brandon Satram. Let's talk. I would absolutely love to hear what other topics you would like for us to cover. 
Um, Y'all have a great rest of the day. Stay safe. Um, wash your hands. Everybody, uh, everybody be well, and uh, we will see you again soon. Thanks so much.